The preaching very specifically delivers the Jesus who fulfills the Old Testament and who is testified by the mighty works that he does and who is crucified by sinful men and raised by his father from the dead and who delivers forgiveness and salvation at specific spots located in this. One more thing I want to look at before we leave Acts, because I think it's very informative for a lot of the discussion you hear in the church today. Turn with me to Acts 17. Acts 17. Follow the area. Acts 17, verse 22. Remember? He walks around and he sees all the idolatry and he's grieved to his heart. And then he, he, he gets on an idea of how he can talk to them. So, Verse 22. Someone want to read it, uh, you know, read it loudly in the room for us. Is that okay? Somebody got it? 22 through, well, till I stop you. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth, and has determined that there are pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Let's stop that. What has he tried to do? Yeah. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, but I say to you, so you see, you know, like very similar to what Jesus does in the in the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah, you're evoking uh, only obviously what was said in the uh, it was Moses, and so it's correct that Jesus was taking it deeper, whereas these folks is pagan. So he's quoting their, he's quoting, he's showing, I'm no dummy, right? I know your culture. I can quote your poets. I know you, you know, and I think. If we could describe it this way, he's trying to build a bridge from, from where they are to the gospel, right? He's trying to construct this bridge. Did you notice what he kind of left out when he constructed the bridge? Do you really not see what he didn't say? There's a lot he didn't say. But there's one real glaring thing he didn't say. He doesn't deal with the crucifixion. Oh, he deals with the fact that he was raised from the dead, but the cross gets no play. Keep that in mind. Look at what he says next. All right, you want to keep on there, Josh? Now when? And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed, among them Dionysius and the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. And read me the next verse. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. All right, hold all that in your mind. Notice there is no epistle to the Athenians. 
right? He moves from Athens to Corinth. And there's no record of a church left behind when he goes. But I think when he went, he had time to think. And we're blessed that he wrote his thinking down. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. In the context of Paul trying to build a bridge to, from culture to, to church, to Christ. What he reflects on this. And look at what he says. We're starting at verse 17 of 1 Corinthians. He begins, Christ didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and what does he say? Not with words of eloquent <coughs> wisdom. Why? Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. And then he says, For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are Oh, you Lutherans, you pay attention to the grammar. <laughs> being saved. <laughs> to us who are being saved, it is, not it was, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discerning of the, uh, discernment of the discerning I will thwart. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, Isaiah kind of wipes out the approach that Paul wanted to take to connect Jerusalem and Athens. Where's the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of this age? Hasn't God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God the wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. Jews demand signs. Greeks seek wisdom. And we preach a crucified Christ. Stumbling block to Jew, folly to Gentile. But to those who are called Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. And then he invites them to think about themselves. Consider your calling, brothers. <laughs> you weren't the wise, not according to worldly standards. You weren't the powerful. Not many of you came from noble birth. But God chose what's foolish in the world to shame the wise, what's weak in the world to shame the strong, what's low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being may boast in his presence. Because of him, you are in Christ Jesus. And he became to us wisdom from God, righteousness, sanctification, redemption. So that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. And then we come to the big words. Look at especially at verse 2. Next chapter. And I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come to you proclaiming the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but a demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith would not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So what are the implications of that? Great mission. Implications, Because, of course, it wasn't evangelism, sir. 
Stop. The gospel always comes as good news. And the good news is the coffee is on. Go grab your coffee and we will be right back. We will unpack the implications on the other side of our coffee. I'm going to go get it. Seriously, I'm going to go get it. <laughs> so he recognized that engaging the culture didn't actually produce the end which he had desired, which is that people come to believe and trust in Christ and be joined to, uh, to him and to the church. It didn't happen. And he went back and said, hmm, I think I blew it because I didn't preach Christ crucified as the wisdom of God. Here's my suggestion to you. The gospel creates its own culture. You do not need to bridge from this to that. You proclaim Christ crucified for the salvation of the world. It creates its own culture. And Christ crucified, well, how do you preach the cross? How do you preach? I, 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 I want to throw an example at you, and I want you to hear. T tell me what you think. When we appreciate how the cross accomplishes our destiny of union with God, we also realize how essential the crucifixion was and is. What is the cross? It's man against God. It's self against love. Calvary was selfishness closing in on love to crush it. Here at Calvary was the climax, but the struggle began at the birth of our Lord. Herod, the incarnation of selfishness, slaughters the innocence of Bethlehem because he was afraid that this newborn king might interfere with his selfishness. The priests and rulers plot to get rid of Jesus, thus to rid themselves of divine love. That's what the high priest meant when he said it would be better for one man to perish, one man to be sacrificed, so that they could continue to be selfish. If you want to get at the meaning of the cross, we must find the interpreter's stone. During one of Napoleon's campaigns, a stone was found which made it possible to read the ancient inscriptions. Rosetta Stone, yeah. Thus the ancient world was revealed to man for the first time. We too must find the Rosetta Stone. We must find a word. We must find four letters and put them together so that they spell L-O-V-E. To discover this way is not easy. We must spend years in Bethlehem, in Gethsemane, on Calvary. Not merely as historical events, but we must enter into fellowship with Bethlehem and Calvary. Love cannot be anything else but love. We can try to define it, but that's as futile as painting a rose. What does love do? Love always gives itself. When love meets self, what happens? Love just keeps on being love, that's all. Love cannot be cruel, nor hate, nor attack. All that love, divine love, can do when it meets its foe is bare its arms and go straight to the cross. Suffering is love's only weapon. What happened 1,900 years ago? What always happens when men love? What always happens to men who love? From the world's point of view, they fail, they go down, they are defeated. Just what happened to our Lord? Draw aside the veil. What a failure. His friend betrays him. His enemies hang him on the cross. He dies and is put into the grave. That's the end of love, they conclude. Even his friends thought he was a failure. They complained, we thought that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. We imagine the crowd standing around the cross saying, 
There he goes. There goes love. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. The officials convene once more. It's been a fine conference. The chairman announces, brethren, he's out of the way. Let us pray. Let us give thanks to God. Don't you think we ought to raise the rental for the t money chargers and changers in the temple since we put up new stands for them? His disciples sadly return to the city. Let's go back to our fishing, Peter says. Too bad. I guess we were wrong. And you say, that's terrible. No, not at all. What do you expect? For love, pushed to its logical conclusion, is always willing to end in sacrifice, in death, in failure. But wait, the grave was not the end. From man's side, it was a failure, but not from God's. Love cannot die like the traditional phoenix. The Christ rose from the ashes of his apparent failure. On the third day, he rose again and thereby showed that divine love triumphs over self. From that time on, it was possible also for men who love to triumph. The sins of men were wiped out on Calvary. But Calvary, which unites men with God, also draws them up to the divine love so that that becomes their love. This love, God's love, the divine love, the Calvary love. It's the only kind of love that's worthwhile. From all this, we draw a mighty conclusion. Why is it we so often fail our fellow man? Why is it we fail in our church work? Why is it we fail in our witnessing, in our mission work? I'm afraid it's because we lack the one thing that'll save the world, divine love, Calvary love. It doesn't radiate through us. It's not our human love that the world needs. This is what the world has been trying to tell us church people for a long time, but we won't agree. We place the blame for our failure everywhere but the right place. And then we keep trying to foist our human love, taint it with self-interest on the world, to which it says, we don't want it. We don't trust it. We can j be just as good, if not better, outside the church. Why is it that the early Christians showed such power? It was because Calvary love, the divine love, radiated in their message and in their lives. That love proved irresistible. The fascinating story of the martyrs fertilized the acres of the church. That love alone brings the kingdom of God to earth. It's the only missionary policy for us to follow. The pure Calvary love will draw men up. It's the only love which achieves a final victory because it's the only love which has an Easter. Any other love is just ashes. Anyone want to take an analysis? Anybody know where it's from? First of all, before I tell you where it's from and who it is, does he get to the heart of the cross in a way that doesn't follow our usual cliches? I think so. The question was, can we preach without, uh, without can we preach the gospel without doing vicarious satisfaction? Not anything against vicarious satisfaction. But that's a powerful way, I think, that the gospel was proclaimed from a standpoint that we don't often hear it preached. It was Bertolt von Schenk. Does the name mean anything to you? He was, he was a nut and a half. <laughs> he was a German with a very great sense of his own von Schinkness. 
his own great importance as German nobility, but he also totally got what makes church, church. This love, which he tasted. If you ever want to have, a, don't, don't have a drink in your mouth while you're reading it, but sip his, his, autobiography, or his autobiography, and he's got a, 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 a lovely little section on there, a toast to Mother Missouri. Uh, <laughs> he had a love-hate relationship. With, with our synod. And, and at the end, he still says, it's, and it's still the best of them all. <laughs> it, it was said that uh, uh, heretics become great men and then turn to punch in while he was sitting there and said, Herthold, you're a great man. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, he truly is an amazing, an amazing man. <laughs> In his, I think in his depth of this, it's, it's, I always hesitate to recommend the book because he begins in an absolutely unconscionable way by suggesting that the Reformed have the Lord's Supper as truly and really as Lutherans do. So it's, I, I can't disagree more strongly with that. that. I mean, we need to take them at, as Dr. Nagel would say, we are not the ones who say they do not have the body and blood of Christ. They are the ones who say that. Okay? <laughs> Uh, but setting that major gaffe aside, you take and read the book, and he opens it ever deeper. Are you ready for? Can, can I can I push it one deeper? In contemplating the life of our Lord, we note two opposing forces: the force of love and the force of selfishness. When these two meet, they always clash. When Jesus told his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and there to suffer and die, Peter said, No, Lord, we want you to stay with us. We love you. Peter was thinking of Peter. This clash is brought into high relief when Jesus faces Caiaphas and Herod. That is history, but is it not the same today? As soon as we begin to love for love, to love like our blessed Lord, we find ourselves in a struggle with the death of our selfishness. St. Paul knew this. He cried out, what I would that I do not do, what I hate that I do, for to will is present. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. But the end, that I would not, that I do. Who shall deliver me? What a terrible struggle is pictured here in this confession, pressed out of Paul's struggle. I find myself not doing what I want to. I want to do good and find myself doing evil. Who can save me from this hell of selfishness. Paul had the answer, the crucified one. Not just because he died as a historical fact. Paul speaks of an actual struggle, something which he faces daily through Christ. You may say, I feel no such struggle. If you mean what you say, you've never been near the cross, which is the vision of goodness, the vision of unselfishness. Bethlehem shows us that our destiny is union with God. Calvary shows us how this destiny has been made possible and how it may be made possible for you today. What happens when I come into fellowship with the cross? Exactly what happened to our Lord. The conflict then begins in earnest. We have had conflicts before we came to the cross. Moral conflicts with our conscience. But we've been able to reason ourselves out of them. For after all, we're better than that brother next door to us. And by sheer will of power, we have practiced control. But when we come to Calvary, there is the conflict between lust and love. Paul tells us, that they that are Christ 
have crucified the flesh and its lusts. We all have our physical troubles. We've been in the school of pain. How we are baffled and mystified in the face of this physical suffering and sorrow. But far more puzzling, baffling, mystifying is spiritual suffering, selfishness in the spiritual sphere. You can't argue yourself out of that. This is the suffering of the great saints. What happens is this. The pure love of God shines through them. It must be unchecked. There must be no obstructions. It must be purified of all self. When pure love, the Calvary love, shines through us, it's like a powerful x-ray which reveals every obstacle it cannot penetrate. Paul does not say that we who believe in the cross should crucify our sins in general. Our lusts should be crucified. That's why the true saints are so much different than many church members. They know that there's a devil because they've done business with him. The devil was so real to Luther that he could throw an inkwell at him. A great English writer tells of a soul's during experience in these words, when I arrived at the station, there I met Satan. If you wish to know how real the devil is, let us start conducting our church life and business along the plans of the great master. If the local parish, which should be the church Catholic in miniature, is to fulfill its destiny as the chaste bride of Christ, then it will meet Satan. <clears throat> How dastardly he works with his undermining and aggressive attacks. Paul met Satan. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the spiritual rulers of darkness, not of this world. The battle of the Christian soul is chiefly against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is the citadel which Satan wants to conquer. When we face the cross, the real cross, we find it difficult. We cannot toy with the cross. We cannot dilute it into empty sentimentality. It is a rugged cross for rugged people. We dislike to criticize the church and preaching. We know how difficult it is. We know what a lonesome place the pulpit can be. But is not our real trouble this? That we've evaded the cross in our preaching. Have we diluted the message of the cross or shelved the cross as we do our doctrine so often taking it out only every Lenten season? We preached a cross without a dare, a cross without a sacrifice, an empty cross, for it's the least disturbing. And what's happened because of all this sickly, sentimental verbiage which has gone out under the name of Lenten preaching? This has happened. To satisfy the masses, to satisfy those whose highest expression of Christian service is to run a card party, we've lost men and women who were groping for the faith. Something more has happened. We've lost our young men and women. We've taken the dare out of religion, the romance, the adventure, the attack, the sacrifice. We've taken the one thing which makes for Christian manhood, sacrifice and struggle, and we've substituted rights and popular preaching, which at best can satisfy only the typical church worker of middle age. <laughs> Our young people have not, will not have that kind of religion at any price because they know it's not true. It's less than life because life is intense, thrilling, challenging, dangerous if it's real life. It's a quest, an adventure. If it's not that, it's dead and young people are not interested in funerals. 
Why is it that certain ideologies gripped the young people of Europe? The answer is their leaders made patriotism a sacrifice, a thrilling adventure. This is written in the height of Nazi mess in Germany. Okay. Youth loves life, and if the church fails to give them the thrills of life, they'll look elsewhere. And youth is right, because the true Christian life demands sacrifice and surrender of self. It was that on Calvary. It is that today. For they that are Christ's are crucified with him. We must realize that religion is not primarily a refuge, but a sacrifice. That is the heart of the Christian faith. It's the heart of our Lord's life. It has to be ours. Then the divine love floods our souls and captivates our lives. Are you saved by the cross? Then your life, with all its struggles, has been caught up with his strength, so that now you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, because it's no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. That's what it means to be saved by the cross. Oh, I could go on, but I, 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 I commend the book for his refusal to let Christ's cross come unglued from the cross that Christ always reaches us. I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but, but Christ lives in me. Yes, sir. Um, how can I argue with anyone who Tom Cruise played his cousin in Valkyrie, but uh, he also argues that that emphasis on the cross has to be coupled with a re-emphasis on communion. He wanted communion in weddings, yes. he wanted communion in funerals, and he argued the key to putting Christ in Christmas was getting communion in the a Christmas Eve service. Could you comment on that connection? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, he, he totally believed that the renewal of the church, he, he believed that Calvary and Bethlehem were not far away, that Jesus had thought of a way and taken thought to bring Calvary and Bethlehem to us today. You do not need to travel in your imagination back to Bethlehem or back to the cross. Christ brings them to you at the table. And there he, he, was, he was utterly convinced that parish renewal actually starts with that. Um, it, 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 any parish would be renewed that, number one, put the Eucharist at the center of everything it did. When we gather, we gather to receive the gift of the Eucharist. And that was to him not just the Lord's Supper, but the preaching, join, the whole divine service, preaching of Christ joined to the gift of Christ's body and blood the seal of forgiveness, the gift of divine love into your life. Number two, he was convinced that any congregation would be blessed that actually learns to devote itself to prayer. That, that, that praying is absolutely a piece of lifting up the burden. I mean, to take, one Russian author said, you take the, to take the world in your hand as an apple and present it to God. <laughs> this you do in union with Christ. It sounds very strange, but this is, it, prayer essentially just says, I recognize that you are a gift of God to me. You are, you are a child of God, and your burdens and struggles are mine. And I will join you in lifting them through Christ to the Father. He also said, you simply teach the tithe. I know you're going to have a fit on that, but I absolutely believe that. It, it, study it in the Old Testament and tell me, where does it show up? You're going to notice this thing is not Mosaic law. Mosaic law codified something that showed up already with Abraham and Melchizedek, with Jacob doing it. I argue that it's actually much more a piece of natural law written into the hearts of men that you give something back to God. It's just, it, it's there. So von Schenk said, just tell him what Malachi said. If you're not doing that, you're stealing from God. It doesn't mean you can't give more, but it means you can't give less, period. There, we don't need to talk about it anymore. We're done talking about money. Um, and, and then uh, he, 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 he really stressed Christian education. If, how many of you have been to his church in the Bronx? I was shocked. The school was so important. That this, and the school's still going, our Savior. The sanctuary is definitely what you would call 
second rate and sort of shoved off to the side because all the money was sacrificially poured into the school. Because he said to the people, this is what we need to do for the future. And that culture still persists. Uh, Pastor Sauer still honors it a great deal there in the Atlantic District. I, but the, the, the point to the Eucharist is absolutely key. He's a big mystical union man. Um, and mystical union, please remember, is not a dirty word. It's very much at the heart of Lutheran orthodoxy. It runs through our hymns. You will never understand the rich language of, of what are the great, two greatest chorales, what are they? Oh, Morning Star and Vakadalf, um, Wake Away. And when did he write them? <laughs> Do you remember what was happening? <laughs> he had like 3,000 funerals in his parish in six months' time. Plague swept through. And in the middle of all that, he writes a book, Mirror of Joy for the Soul just rejoicing in, in the great gifts that God has for us in his son and so thankful that all this suffering and all this misery and all this death is not the end. How to help his people rejoice in this and sing this. He writes these two songs and puts them, actually there's three. I, I don't know why the third one never actually made it in, but the, 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 there are two that, that, that made it at the end of the book with, with his, with, we assume his own tunes, that, that he wrote the tunes. Um, and the joy that rings through them is unmistakable, but so is the mystical union. E'en as the branch is in the vine, thy life, my life, supplying. And uh, clearly tied to the Eucharist, uh, we, we answer all the joyful call and follow to das Abendmahl. I'm, no German hearing that would have heard that as anything but we go to the altar. Um, so you have, you have there a, a, a deep connection between the, the preaching of the cross and the preaching of the mystical union, which makes the cross be the very pattern and gift of your life. Was that the presence? This is the book, The Presence. The presence. Yes. These were actually, he put it all as a book. It's all a book. I suspect he turned his sermons into books because they preach so well. <laughs> you know, it, it, there's no indication in the book that it was actually sermons, though. You but, can get it for 1250 from the American Publicity Bureau. Yeah, they, they reprinted it. Just don't be turned off by the first chapter. Because I t I've warned you, it's horrible. It's there. <laughs> the first was a chapter, and then I didn't finish the second I thought, chapter. Yeah. I thought that did a nice job of mm -hmm. uh, kind of unpacking the love of God in Christ, self-sacrifice. The second thing that you read is very compelling. I can see how it develops culture. But if you try to preach that, you have it really was preaching the law pretty forcefully. Oh, yeah. There, yeah. Was, there was no gospel. There. I stopped. There was no local there. Yeah. Was, yeah. He, he, he never, I mean, I, 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 from anything I've seen, he never stops without getting you to, to he calls, he, he calls the, the, the Eucharist is, is the crescent at which this divine love comes and is kindled in you. Um, so it, it, he will always drive that. Um, but he points out that when the divine love comes, it's a fiery love that burns out everything that's not that love in our lives. It transforms us. Um, and this is, very, again, very much a piece of Lutheran orthodoxy, which we've lost. I, I do believe that in our preaching, when we've had this problem of this sort of law, gospel, and then people will call it third use of the law. This is always problematic in your mind because you, those are the Holy Spirit's uses. You cannot control what the Spirit does with the law. You can only preach law and gospel. I think the movement that what they were really looking for is the preaching of the law 
the preaching of the gospel, mystical union, which is not law, which is whole gift, but which is the means by which love, love himself, plants himself into you. It's the fulfillment and way beyond of all law. Yeah. It's, it's a profound question. I think we have to recognize Paul did not choose to go preach in the Areopagus. Paul was dragged to the Areopagus, and there he gave an account for the hope that's in him. In the Treasury of Daily Prayer, Tuesday's Daily Prayer asks that we would always be watchful for the confession of Christ's name. And this is, I think, that especially as we go into ever darker days, this is where we really need to be uh, focusing our mind and attention. The, the church is the gift of the kingdom to the world. That's what she is. And when we stand to give confession of Christ in public witness, well, think about how Luther and Hour finally fixed that. Do you remember what they used to say? What was their motto? And finally somebody said, and the nation's to the church. The to the church. <laughs> the, 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 it, again, if you leave out the specific locatedness of the gift, you haven't given the whole gospel. And the church is the location whereby, uh, where all that, that, that gift of divine love is literally planted into this age. We are going to have opportunities to confess Christ as we are constantly going to be running and having run-ins with, well, especially confession of Christ in, in, in the mind of the early church was before rulers. <laughs> this is where we're going to have the opportunity once again. Um, and uh, as, as this, this opens up, we need to be always aware of it, but it's never an end in itself. It's always a, a pulling back to, to what's being offered in, in the church. Um, any other comments or questions on, on the, 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 yeah? So you've just written my perfect introduction to my next section, which was called the liturgical context. <laughs> the, thank you. I, I absolutely agree. When I said that we have a, 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 the reason I don't think we have the crisis in liturgy per se is because the liturgy is there. It's, it may not be used, but it's there and it's full and it's beautiful and it's great. The crisis is in the preaching itself, which many times isn't there. I had a, a, a comment that so many times what we have are the how-tos. And these are the contents of the sermons that we get. How-to. I'm not dismissing that it's important to know how-to. 
at the same time, that's not preaching the gospel, which is at the very heart of what the divine service is actually the forum for, for the proclamation of this, uh, this word. Um, I, I want to talk about liturgical context next. And when I say liturgical context, the first thing we have to recognize is churchier context for preaching, right? You, you have these days that come up. Why are they, what's the whole purpose of the church here? Have you ever really thought about what it's there to do? It's part of the culture that the preaching of the cross itself created. What's it there for? You see, if you were to try to press all of the good stuff that's in Jesus down into a single celebration, you couldn't do it. The gift is too big, right? It's massive. It overflows. Sir. Oh, 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, it overflows. And so what the church in her great wisdom did was to say, and this happened without anybody. This was not a committee. This was no, you know, it's just developed. Uh, Dr. Stucker could probably talk for us many, many hours on the the, the mess he has on the, 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 the mess of its development. Uh, I mean, it just it, it just grew organically, but it grew out of out of the life of Christ. What do you? How do you take the life of Jesus and celebrate it? The gift that it is, it has to. It fills up a year and more, um, and so the church year is the first sort of context, and then the readings drew. They were drawn to the day, right? How many of you are going to celebrate the nativity of our Lord and it's, it's midnight and you're going to read, I don't know, the Sermon on the Mount? Right? You go, no. It, and our people begin to have these sort of expectations. How many of you in this room have been foolish enough to celebrate the midnight service and not sing Stille Nacht? <laughs> you probably will only do it once. Why? Because, remember what I said yesterday? Oh, it's, it's Or Jerusalem that weep is Sunday. That same expectation for, for Christmas Eve, even though it's, you know, it's not a great I mean, let's say, it's not great musically, it's not great textually. Nevertheless, the people expect that to be part of their celebration. Don't take their candle away or that. By the way, if you are doing Christmas, you have to, in the liturgical context of Christmas, you have to fight the cultural battle against the English carols. Don't fight it by insisting that they not be used but you must teach your people to love the richer, deeper German songs. I, I, I'm not saying, I don't have one drop of German blood in me. I am not culturally favored, I mean, favoring Germans. I just note that, I mean, just compare it. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, all is bright, round young virgin, mother and child, Holy infant, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. All my heart this night rejoices as I hear far and near sweetest angel voices. You know, look at the weight of a Gerhard piece to the weight of the carols that have become common in English, with the exception of Wesley. Wesley knows how to make a carol have great weight. Hark the Herald Angels Sing is a pretty hefty theological piece. But, but even so, the Gerhardt stuff is really, really heavy and great. So there is a culture and a context for the preaching that's first of all the church here, but second of all consists in the readings that sort of form the culture of the day. And I think we probably are going to stop there because I need to get into, I was going to use the example of St. Stephen's Day. We'll pick that up when we get back. If you celebrate St. Stephen's Day, you have the... You know, the readings that are read, the readings are the context, and they will immediately set up, I think, something that you have to address right away in the sermon. You don't need to find something in the hearers' lives and build a bridge over to the readings. 
The context is they've, you've got a bunch of people that sat there and just heard a bunch of readings. Deal with the readings. Uh, more on that uh, in the next session. Thanks. Oh, yeah, that would not be good. <laughs>